or share with your colleagues. Uh, so again, this is Marcy Samples with Washington Student Achievement Council, and in the room I also have Kelly Keeney, and for a few minutes just to help us get started uh, is Beth Kelly. It probably looks like Sarah Weiss is the presenter. She's not. She just, uh, she's not here, uh, but she was the name that came up as the default for us today. So uh, thank you for joining us, and it looks like there are 29 of you on the call, so thank you on this Monday after a holiday, uh, making sure that you join this really important training. I know for some of you this is going to be a refresher, but I promise there are new features and new reminders, and you will appreciate that you participated in this. Uh, so please be patient as we review some things if, if this is old news to you. How do I go to the next? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are going to give a brief introduction to the portal and just what it's all about. We'll spend some time on data collection and reporting and the requirements we have around that. We will review the activity types and match activities. We'll talk about reporting non garrett student and family participation and reporting timelines. And then when I get done with all of those pieces, Kelly's going to give you some demo on some of the features. So you can read all about this. Uh, we will send out this PowerPoint after this session today to all of you. And so it does have some active live links in it. So you can see as I hover over the grant for coordinator manual, um, all everything we're covering today is included in the manual and so if you click on that it will go to that section uh, so the section we're covering today is section four data collection and reporting and these are all of the items included in that section so what is a portal um, how do we make this go away so like you can, you can click up the X there you go. See that X? Just click it. Um, okay. How do I minimize? I'm sorry. Just a moment. I need some instructions from Beth. Click that. Okay. Um, also, throughout this session, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box, and we'll pause every once in a while and uh, stop and answer those questions. So you can type questions. You are all muted, so you can't uh, ask questions aloud, but please type them in, and again, we'll pause occasionally to do that. Um, so what is the portal? It is a way for us to securely collect data uh, about student, family, and staff participation. Uh, there's also other information that is stored in there that I'll touch on in just a moment. Um, but it is secure, so it's all very protected uh, and uh, student information is considered confidential, so we take that very seriously here. Um, there's student level information for all programs administered by WASAC, not just Gear Up, and that includes all of the financial aid programs, GET, College Bound Scholarship, and as we know, Gear Up. It requires a username and password, and I believe that everyone uh, in our schools to date uh, has been given a username and password. If you will be entering in the portal and don't have that yet, then Kelly will provide that to you. Um, as a federal program, we do report annually to the U.S. Department of Education. They want to know that we're making progress toward our grant goals and objectives that we said we wanted to achieve for this grant cycle. So this is our way to report that information. And we also have multiple levels of program evaluation. One of evaluation is a, is a multi-state longitudinal evaluation, and we call that the College and Career Readiness Evaluation Consortium. And along with 13 other Gear Up programs, we've been tracking our Grant 3 students and their participation, and we will continue to track them for the next six years to look at their post-secondary outcomes and how it relates to the activities they participated in. So we're still actively engaged in that process. Then annually, we have an external evaluator, RGI Corporation. Many of you have met Anthony. 
Um, they compile an annual report for us as a program and for our individual schools. And then we have other uh, ad hoc program reports that we uh, have them complete for us, including our exit survey evaluation. So there are several modules in the portal. Uh, the first is the one you will use most often, and that is the student and family activities uh, module. Then there is the professional development module where you will actually enter your participation in today's portal uh, and other things like Gear Up West, our workshops, and any other pro dev that we help you support. There's a section where you'll enter college applications, both submitted and accepted. And there are reports that you can access as well, uh, including student participation uh, by student. And then there are other detailed and summary reports available as well. Finally, uh, we have a secure messaging portal. That is a way to communicate with Kelly confidentially and to send a student information reports to us, and we will cover that later as well. So some things to think about related to documentation. I'm sure you've all heard this before, but if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. So it's really important that we keep track of all of our student participation, family participation, and staff participation on paper documents. And those are available in the coordinator manual. And the paper documents must match the electronic documents. So the portal is your electronic documentation of what you've collected on paper. And keep in mind that those can be audited both by us and by state auditors at any time. Uh, it, state auditors have come in and looked at those to verify that you're serving Gear Up eligible students. So they are, there's a history of those being audited. And then all of the paper documentation must be retained for six years after the end of the grant. Um, it looks like there's at least one other person that can't hear us. I'm going to provide um, the number. You do need to call in to hear us. So let me just pause to do that. So hopefully that will work. All right, so um, back to documentation. Sorry about that pause. Um, we have forms available to you again in the coordinator manual in the data collection and reporting section. And you must use those forms. We ask that you not make any substitutions that you use the forms as we've developed them because that will ensure that they have all of the required information. And so these are the four forms. And again, these are active links. I'm not going to click on them now, but um, when you have this PowerPoint, if you can't find in the grant coordinator manual the forms you're looking for, you can directly link to them here. So the first is an individual student services tracking log. And that's when you're doing one-on-one uh, -on -one services, maybe throughout the day, throughout the week. They might be short uh, meetings with students on various topics, um, but that's individualized services. The others are for group activities, the student events, family events, and pro dev events. And that's when you're uh, going to have uh, folks sign in, and that is really important that um, participants actually sign the participation log to verify that they participated. Uh, really important. You can't just pre-fill that in. You can't have someone else sign for everyone. It does need to be um, signed by the folks that show up. So you can pre-print them uh, with names printed out, and there is a way to actually do that from the portal. Uh, but then they have to initial or sign that they were there to verify that. 
So we're going to talk about professional development a little bit more. Um, there's a question, can you use an attendance sheet? And um, there are some circumstances when you could use an attendance sheet, but that would be um, like a school-wide event. If you were having an, an assembly um, then that all students participated in, you could print out the attendance sheet for the day as verification. But that's only when it's a school-wide event. Otherwise, you are expected to print out the participation logs and have folks sign in on those. So for professional development, um, we want you to enter all of the Gear Up sponsored professional development. And again, that would include Gear Up West for this last October. So we're going to have you go back and enter that. Then our November, March, April, and August workshops, and you'll enter participation for those. And then you'll also enter any other professional development where either staff are paid by Gear Up to participate, or the trainer is paid by Gear Up, or the travel and registration fees are paid by Gear Up. So anytime that we are sponsoring or supporting financially uh, Gear Up professional development, um, then, then that will be entered into the portal. So some common things uh, that come up are AP Summer Institute, AVID training, for example, uh, attending the WAFA conference or the counselors conference. All of those things are very common for us to pay for, and so you would enter those. So the professional development module will capture everything that uh, Gear Up supports financially or otherwise. Also, this is a new feature this year. We have added the capability to uh, enter advisory committee participation in the portal. You'll do that within the professional development module. And uh, this, again, is new. We haven't had a way for you to do this in the past. So that means you no longer need to send that information to Kelly. You can just go ahead and enter it into the ProDev module. So you are required to have two advisory committee meetings per year. And as a reminder for the new folks, uh, there are um, membership requirements in terms of what categories of folks you need to include in that. And the purpose of advisory committee meetings is to let folks know what's going on in Gear Up, but also to get their feedback um, and support for the program and find out how they might help you implement uh, your plan. And uh, quite often, this is a great way to solicit volunteers as well. I think it was a federal way that shared how they invited, uh, talked to their advisory committee about match. I might have the story a little bit wrong, but, um, and out of that, they they were able to get more volunteers to come in and actually generate even more match by app, making that ask. Uh, sorry if I have that a little bit wrong, but it's a great idea anyway. <laughs> um, so you'll add it in the professional development tab and there's a, there are different session types and so you'd call that other and then you can add a community member and designate their staff role as an advisory member. So I think for those of you that have used the portal before, that will make a lot of sense. Uh, for those of you that are new, uh, you, you, if you need uh, step, if you need Kelly to uh, step in and help you, um, then she can do that. I'm getting pop-ups on my screen uh, right now, and so it's a little distracting. But I'm going to go pause for questions. Um, so someone is asking if we have a financial literacy class every day, um, do the students have to sign a form? So that's a great question and another example of when you could use the attendance roster as your evidence. Now you still need to print it out and you need to have that in your records so that you can show on paper who participated. But yes, that can be your backup for a class that Gear Up is sponsoring, uh, like in that case, financial literacy. Um, then um, there's another question that seems similar. I'm not sure I understand it. It says, if it is a class such as on careers or NAV 101, 
Oh, and so maybe it's just a one day event. So maybe you're covering a gear up topic in a advisory class that is a gear up sponsored activity and you'll enter that, but it's just that one day, then yes, you would use a sign in sheet. Um, but if it's a class that's every day for a quarter, for example, then you could use the attendance rosters. If that didn't answer your question, Anne, will you please clarify for me? All right. So that's advisory committee. Then student activities. And it's really important to understand what we mean by direct service. So, and, and this is true for student and family activities, that we want to capture in the portal all direct service. That means a GearUp staff member usually, although it can be another person, is providing a GearUp service directly to a student or to a family member. And so that's usually in person or phone, um, there's an interaction that occurs. And it can be individual, small group, or large group, but the idea is it's a direct service. So really, especially for gear up paid staff, anytime you're interacting with a student or a family member, that's something you're going to both capture on paper and in the portal. So, first two bullets are the same for family activities. Um, these also include your family events, and please note, I think most of you are aware of this at this point, but we have changed the requirement for family events. The requirement is now three events per year. You're certainly welcome and encouraged to do more than that, but at a minimum, you must do three nights or events. Um, one of them can be your orientation for families, uh, or you can combine that with another family event. Um, family events may or may not include students. Sometimes students actually come to family events without their parents or family members, and that's also acceptable, um, but we want to capture all of that participation. So I'm going to move on now to the service definitions. We also call these activity types. And these are really important that you have a strong understanding of these activity types. You can also think of them as the categories of services that we provide. So um, everything that we do fits into a category. And again, this is an active link. When you get this presentation, you can click on this. So you go directly to the Gear Up Coordinator Manual um, to read these in full. I actually encourage you to print out this section and keep it by your computer uh, so that when you're entering activities in the portal, you can refer to this. We've been using these activity types for the last five years, and I will tell you, I still have to look at them um, sometimes to determine where an activity falls um, because, uh, you know, it is a little bit complicated, so it, it should be something you refer to often. Um, so we use this so that we have consistency in reporting so that when we say something is a counseling activity that all of the counseling activities are similar. When we say something is an educational field trip, we all know what it means. And that comes out of the work that we've done through CCREC, that National Longitudinal Study that I referenced earlier. And so we, along with 13 other states and now more, the, the definitions have actually expanded and used to more Garrett programs across the country. Um, so that we all know what we're talking about when we refer to these definitions and the kinds of activities that Gear Up provides. So it's really improved our consistency and accuracy in our reporting. So uh, there are um, a total of uh, 16 student and family activity types, uh, 12 student, four family, and then there are additional pro-dev activity types.
So here is the comprehensive list of the different types of student activities. Uh, you'll notice that under tutoring and homework assistance and educational field trips, there are also additional subgroups, uh, but these are uh, the activities that will show up um, in the definitions. There are a few others that aren't here. Uh, we do have an other and we have an other fee only. So there are a couple more in addition to this. And then for family activity types, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, there are four types. One is college visits, which we really encourage you anytime you're taking students on a college visit to also include family. Then counseling and advising, which is individualized information. So um, it's when it's really focused and tailored to the individuals that you're talking to. Then there are workshops, and those typically are about some kind of college prep or planning and or financial aid. And then we have a category for orientation and other celebratory events. In the professional development module, we have four types, uh, activity types. One is the Gear Up Lead Pro Dev. Again, that's Gear Up West and our four workshops. Then we have um, an orientation and match training, which is required annually. We have webinars, and which is what we're doing today. And then we have other, which would include things like AVID and AP Institute. I'm going to pause for questions. Um, it says, for the college visits, would we count it as a family activity when the parents are chaperones? Um, if the parents are, are the parents of the children attending, absolutely, you would call that a family activity. And so you can create that college visit uh, as a family event and then add your family members in, absolutely. All right, moving on. Again, um, we want you to really work on referring to the activity types every time you do an entry to make sure you have it accurate. Uh, please be sure you're using the manual and any time that you are not sure, please ask Kelly. And uh, it's always helpful if you're unsure to just kind of talk that through and talk about what's really happening at the activity uh, to make sure it's aligned with our definition. There are some things that we don't want you to report in the portal. And that would include any direct service that lasts less than five minutes. So we call that not portal worthy. Um, it takes more time to do the paperwork than it did to do the interaction. So you're off the hook if it's less than five minutes. Um, then we don't want you to include activities that are not direct service. So these are still great things for you to do um, and we completely support you in doing them. But because they don't um, have a direct service involved, we don't want you to report them. And those include newsletters or other electronic one-way communication, including one-way email contact. Now, if you have a back and forth email exchange with a family member, for example, that lasts, you know, you could say more than five minutes, then that's okay to uh, put into the portal. Um, but if it's shorter than that or you don't get a reply, then we don't consider that a direct service. You don't enter just materials or stuff, I always say, um, that you purchase. Um, so you might buy calculators or computers. Um, that in and of itself is not a direct service, and so that's not entered. And then activities that are not supported by Gear Up and would occur anyway are not entered. For example, Smarter Balanced Assessment. Um, so Gear Up activities that are direct service that last longer than five minutes are entered in the portal. 
we always get questions about student-led conferences, and, and really the answer is, should it be entered in the portal? It depends. Um, so if you've never done student-led conferences before and you're starting them in Grant 4 as part of your Gear Up plan, and Gear Up is providing a service during the conference, then yes, that would be entered. Um, but if you've always done student-led conferences, they, they do support Gear Up goals. Um, but if it's, if it's old uh, activity for you, then it would not be entered in the portal. But if Gear Up hosts a table at your student-led conference and meets with families uh, during that time to provide information and maybe some counseling during that time to families, then you would absolutely enter that in the portal, but only for those families that actually participate in that activity. I have a question about if a parent takes the student to a job shadow, can I count the parent? So I think what is being asked is if, um, if Gear Up sets up a job shadow, but the parent actually uh, takes the student, transports the student, um, then yes, you can count the parent as going on the job shadow with the student, but only if they actually went. If they're just providing transportation, no, you would not include the parent in that activity reporting. You'd only include the student. But if the parent participates in the job shadow along with the student, then you would count that. All right, a little bit about match activities. So a lot of you will be having not sure what that meant. I'm going to continue. Um, we'll have uh, match activities. Uh, so others providing services uh, to your gear up students that you're coordinating and your county is matched. And so those are still entered into the portal. Uh, just as if you're up provided them and all of the same guidance applies. So whether it's paid for by gear up or is supported through a match contribution, all the same comments above apply for portal entry. We do have a category called other fee only, an activity type that is called other fee only. And that occurs when Gear Up pays for a service or a good on behalf of students, but no direct service is actually provided. And we have some really good examples, again, in that definition guide, to, so please check there for further clarification. But that might include things like tuition only for summer school or tuition for a credit retrieval course or college in the high school, but we're just paying that fee. We're not providing any classroom support for the students or anything like that. Um, might include AP test fees or summer camp fees when you're, we're just paying for the student to go do the thing, um, but we're not going along with them or providing any support. Um, so again, that's other fee only, and in those cases, the invoice or receipts, the only documentation that's required. You can tell, because it'll light up. Okay. We also have a category I just want to talk about for a minute called tests and test prep. So um, all test preparation activities are documented and reported just as all other activities. So again, having students and or families sign in, those might be things like an SAT prep class, maybe you're doing some Khan Academy work, um, on SAT prep, uh, maybe you're doing an ACT question of the day, um, those kinds of things are all reported just like other activities. Then this is one place, test is one place where um, things are a little bit different than everything else I just said. So regardless of the funding source, we want to document the tests that students take. Specifically, PSAT 8, PSAT, SAT, Aspire, ACT, AccuPlacer, and ASVAB, and any other community college placement test. So the Department of Ed asks 
asks us specifically to report these um, test completion uh, statistics for our students. So we do want to capture all of that, whether Garrett pays for it or not. Um, and so you would enter that in the test and test prep activity type. And we have very specific guidance on how to name those tests. So again, please refer to the manual for additional clarification. But that is a little bit different than other guidance given for the portal entry. And this is a place where even if you've been around for a while, uh, listen up because this is a little bit of a change in our practice. Um, we are asking that you record in the portal all students who participate in GEARUP supported activities regardless of their GEARUP eligibility. So if you host an event um, and other students are included, whether we pay for them or not, we want them on the sign-in sheets and we want them entered in the portal. Little bit of background on that, in this uh, grant for application, we did include additional outreach to other students as one of our uh, priorities. So we do want to be able to show all of the students that are beneficiaries of the Gear Up program and not just Gear Up eligible students. So I realize that is a pretty significant change for those of you who were with us last time. So um, please pay attention to that guidance and think about how you will uh, manage that. So outreach to other students is allowable and so we want you to document that. And the way that I think of it is, is that the portal is really where the whole story lives. So the portal tells the story of who we're doing, who we're serving and how we're having an impact. So it's a complete reflection of the work that we're doing on behalf of students, families, and staff. So pretty significant change. It'll take us all some, probably a couple reminders to remember that. I'm gonna pause for questions. Um, we paid for ACT testing last year and we entered it as a fee only. Should we have entered it into a regular activity? So all tests are entered as test prep. So tests, ACT, SAT, and the others we listed are uh, activity type tests and test prep. We probably changed that for you. We probably caught that. Yeah. Um, so yes. Uh, all tests go under tests and test prep and are not fee only. That's an AP test. Yeah, AP tests, because they're not a college placement test, would still be fee only. And then I have a question about would that include my college fair? So do we count all students who attend the college fair that Gear Up sponsors? Absolutely. So that's a great example of where. Um, gear up can have a school-wide impact and so um, you can host a college fair there's no additional cost to include all of your students we hope that you would include all of them and yes we'd like to capture that in the portal so we're asking that you would record all students in the portal for that college fair Another question related to a college fair, what about a district-wide college fair where students from non-gear up schools attend? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, we will only have uh, gear up schools in the portal. So if there are non-gear up schools attending, then you would not be able to include them. So thank you for that clarification. That doesn't happen very often, but it does in a couple of our districts. How often do we report? This is probably what I would say is the area in need of greatest improvement uh, from lots of us. Um, so we ask that all of your participation be entered into the portal at least weekly. And um, I know it's very easy to procrastinate because you guys are all about the students and providing student services and doing paperwork is quite often the last thing on your to-do list. Um, but we have uh, definitely ran into some issues over this last year when um, 
participation is not entered regularly. So I need to sincerely ask that uh, you get back into the habit of entering all participation at least weekly. If that means, you know, setting aside Friday afternoons to do data, then that's what needs to be done. Uh, but you really need to prioritize this work so it's done in a timely manner. There are some annual deadlines where we will close the portal. Um, and so we'll give you some last chance to get caught up. Uh, but the portal school year calendar is August 1st through July 31st. So everything for the current school year, the 17-18 school year, um, started on August 1st and goes through July 31st. We do think we will have students this week. So um, we thought we would have them last week, but I, I think students should start showing up this week and Kelly will send a note out as soon as we have students in the portal. So what that means is on July 31st of each year, um, the, por the portal closes uh, for the school year that ended on June 30th. So after that date, we can't enter activity. And so every year, no matter how many reminders we send out, it seems that we lose a pretty good chunk of uh, activity reporting because people forget to enter items by the deadline which is why I'm really reiterating that you need to complete your portal entries every week. If it goes longer than that, we find that you're forgetting that things happened or uh, activities just aren't getting reported, paperwork gets lost, um, all kinds of complications can enter in, and then we lose that reporting opportunity. And there's really nothing we can do to go back and change that. We do give you a two-week grace period after July 31st to make sure everything's complete. And then after that time, it's, it's gone and we lose, again, anything that was not reported. So please pay attention to this. Please really think about how you can structure your time to make sure that reporting is getting done on a weekly basis. And Kelly will be monitoring that. And if we see a week go by that you don't enter things, you're, you're going to get reminders from us that you're not in compliance of that requirement. Couple of questions. Let's see, just one. Should we document when they actually did the test even no, they do that, even though they do that on their own time? So yes, always you want to put the actual date an activity occurred. So if the student goes out and takes the ACT, um, think about how you're going to communicate that with them and document that so that you can enter that. But yes, actual dates should always be used. We don't want to just make up dates that the students participated in activities. So tracking tests can be a little bit challenging because often students go do that on their own. They might ask your help for registration or something like that. But think about how you're going to communicate and track testing. All right, we've been pausing for questions, so I think we're all caught up on those. And uh, it's just about time to turn it over to Kelly, but again, I think all of you at this point have a username and instructions to access the portal, but if you don't, here's Kelly's contact information. In addition to that, there are other resources in the portal that you can have access to. Uh, one is the College Bound Scholarship, and for our cohort schools especially, this is important um, because we want to really focus on making sure all College Bound eligible students are signed up. So there are different kinds of access for the middle school versus high school. Um, middle school will tell you all of the eligible student names, their application status, some other demographic information. In high school, you would only see their student names and their application status. If you don't have access to the College Bound part of the portal and would like to have access because that's part of your work, then there's the email address and just send your name, your title, your school name, and your phone number to that email and they'll reply giving you um, instructions and information on how to do that. And again, the goal is both to increase our sign-up rates, making sure that all eligible students 
um, are signed up and then to be able to provide ongoing support to them through accessing the scholarship when they graduate. Then we also have the FAFSA completion portal. Um, that's in partnership with the U.S. Department of Education and provides um, the FAFSA status for all seniors in your school district. So it'll tell you who completed an application, who submitted but has an incomplete application, and who has not submitted. Uh, so really important data for us, uh, for our seniors, and we've found that it does help increase FAFSA success uh, when schools are using that part of the portal. Uh, it's important to note that no other FAFSA information is available. So you're not going to see income or family status or anything like that. It's just names and the status of their application. Access is limited to superintendents and or their designees at this time. And so you can check internally in your school to find out who has access. But if you're unsure, again, here's an email to uh, send an inquiry. Um, and then just note that WASFA, Washington's application for uh, undocumented students, is not tracked in any way, and we don't have information available that uh, WASFA uh, applications are regarded as highly confidential, and that information is not even shared internally with us. Uh, so highly protected information. Um, as such, please don't share with us your students who complete the WASFA. Um, you should also hold that confidential. All right, um, so I'm going to turn this over to Kelly now. And just for the purposes of this demonstration, we're using the training portal slides. So some of, some of the slides will have a big red training label on it, but you wouldn't actually see that. And then there's the link. Uh, to the portal, again, an active live link when you get these slides, and here's Kelly. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I know I was tempted to do some extra shopping and take the day off, but I talked myself into coming in and doing a portal demonstration <laughs> instead. So thank you all for being here. Um, so let's get right on to the demonstration part of this webinar. So when you first log into the webinar, or excuse me, the portal, this is the first screen that you'd, you'd see, as Marcy mentioned, the big training thing won't be in the middle of it. Um, on this, you'll see some a confidentiality statement. I would encourage you to read this so that you know what that contains and what you're agreeing to by using this site. Um, you will see that you have been logged in, not Fred Stead, but this is what it'll look at like with your name. Um, you'll be able to log out here. Um, you'll also have some menu items that, um, or drop down boxes that'll show different menu items that you have to choose from. So we'll go onto that screen. So these are from your menu selections as I showed you on the last page. Um, you have the home, common, and programs. Underneath your common, you have change your password and messages and files. And under programs, you have gear up. So something to be said about messages and files, and on the next screen, we'll kind of go into that a little bit more. But this is where you find your secure messaging screens. And um, that's how you would communicate uh, priority schools. That's how you'd send us your eligibility. Um, materials and any comp student confidential information that you need to send us would go through the secure portal and not through your regular email. Marcy, do you want to say anything more about that? I would just say that um, under programs, if you did have access to College Bound right. and or FAFSA completion portal, those would also appear in that list. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcy, for clarifying that. Okay, so as Marcy stressed before, and I've, I'm going to stress again, messages and files is secure messaging. You don't want to send personally identifiable student information through email. You don't want to share with us confidential student stories. 
and you want to use a portal secure messaging to send priority eligibility verification forms. You want to send your middle school math completion forms. And you can get to those instructions using this link um, where it'll tell you a little bit more how to, to send those forms through the secure messaging portal. So when you first get, you log into your account, this is actually the first um, screen that you're going to see is this dashboard screen. Um, this just kind of gives you, and you really, this won't mean a lot until you get student activities in there because this is based on student activities and GPA, and none of that information will be immediately available because you won't have students until probably, hopefully, sometime this week. So, one thing I did want to point out on the screen, though, is up top is where all your menu items are. So, you have your activities, you have activity reports, you have a link to your master calendar, your professional development, and then there's also a student screen. So, the dashboard is a tool, um, basically, for you to, to track your current activity data. Uh, there are two tabs associated with the dashboard, the student tab and the activity tab. The student tab tracks the data in relation to the student's GPA. And then the activity tab will uh, track the student's participation data. And then it also compares it with your same model. So your, if you're a priority school, your participation data will be, will be compared against other priority schools and vice versa for um, cohort schools. So this is your main activity screen, which you'd get to by clicking on the activity link at the top of the page. Um, this is where you will add a new activity in this big box. By pressing on that, it'll go to another screen that will help you add your actual activity. Um, from the screen, you can see your high school. You will have, um, you can search for an activity by typing the name of the activity here. Uh, you can use a date range to search for an activity. You can search for it by activity type. The academic year is shown here. It'll always default to the current academic year. And you can search for activities um, by their status. So if you just want to search for, for activities that haven't been um, marked in compliance, we'll go into some of this later, um, then you could, you'd be able to search by that as well. I'll just add that because we're in a new grant cycle, um, we are starting fresh with the portal, and so you won't be able to access previous years of data at all. It's all been cleaned out and stored in a different place uh, for our records, so just keep that in mind. Right. Yeah, good point. So the only um, year that you'll see currently is the 2017-2018. There won't be any other years like other schools might be or past schools in, our, in Grant 3 might be used to. Um, if you're at the screen, and, and this is something that I just want to mention really quick, um, if you just click search and you don't have any parameters in here, it's automatically going to come up with a list of all of the activities that you've entered to date. So it's a good way to view things, and, and I'll touch on that later, but I just wanted to point that out here. Um, right now, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to go through kind of really quickly how to add a new activity. And like I said before, you do that by just clicking on the Add a New Activity button. These are the, the boxes that will show up for you. First, this box where you'll, you'll actually name the activity. Um, it'll have you. It'll actually, you'll be able to, so if you'll be able to, you're High school will default to this, but for schools that have multiple schools like Vancouver, there will actually be a drop-down box where you'll have to choose the school that you're choosing um, to add that activity to. Then the academic year, and then you'll choose the activity type based on um, your great understanding of the service definitions <laughs> and using that, those service definitions. Uh, and so here I've named the activity, 
you want to make sure that you're naming it something that is descriptive um, and you're choosing the activity type that best suits that name. So after school tutoring, math. And it's, the activity type is tutoring, homework assistance, math. Then you're going to go down here and add that activity. The next screen is going to show you what, it, what it's going to look like after you've added the activity. So this is called the activity detail screen. This activity detail box is going to tell you the name of the activity that you just added, the activity type, the school that you added it to, Gear Up School, the year that it was added, and then the dates would show up down here once you've actually given a date to that activity. Right now, you haven't told it what dates these are on yet, so it's not going to be showing anything. When you, to add the activity, you're going to actually go to the date in the calendar, and I'm going to try to go back and show you. So if I wanted to add this activity today, um, I would click on the 13th, and then that box on the next screen would show up. I, I believe I added this, this particular activity on the 14th. So we're going to show, so this is the box that will show up when you're going to add that activity. Um, you'll see a start time. This will be defaulted to to an 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. You'll need to change this. You'll need to add a um, participating educator. This is something new. Um, there's also a box for session notes and a full school event box that will automatically add all the students to it. Um, do you want to say something about full school events? Because yeah, that would be the example we shared earlier about if you had a career fair um, for all students. If, so I would say just be cautious if you're going to click that full school event box uh, because it will add everyone. Then you'll need to go into that activity and delete the students who were absent that day. So it is a way to add everyone, but you still have to go back and correct for attendance. So after you've added your participating um, educator, which you'll have to do, you would go and click on one of these two boxes down below, and I think it, I believe it shows it on the next screen that you do that. So, so for this activity, for my math activity, I've added it on the 14th. The, the start time is 2.30 in the afternoon to 3.30 in the afternoon. My pr primary um, staff member, Jelly Beanie, and my session notes, I brought some extra supplies to this one. Please note that your session notes are only good for this day's activity. So only on the 14th of September will these session notes show up. It will show up. So they're exclusive to, to the date that you added this, this activity. Um, and then I'm going to want to choose, I want to either return to the calendar, which means that it will return without adding any students or anything to it. And I can continue to keep adding these dates or I can click on save and go to participants, which it'll take me to the participant screen. And so in this case, I chose just to go back to the calendar because I wanted to show you what it looks like. So now you can see the calendar view has changed. Now we have the activity showing up on the 14th, and it's also showing in this, these list of dates right here. So um, if you did go to this and you wanted, and let's say that we wanted to add more dates to this activity, and because this is just a demo screen, it's hard to show you that. But you can add, so this activity calendar is specifically for this activity. If this is an ongoing activity, you would continue to use the same calendar to keep adding additional dates. So if you click on the 17th and then the 19th, well, not the 17th because it's Sunday, but the 18th and then the 20th and then the 22nd, it would keep adding the same activity to the calendar. You would have a way to add your participants. We'll go through that a little bit. But I just wanted you to be aware that every time you add an activity, you don't have to add a new date for it, a new activity calendar for it. It will fall under the same activity calendar. So for us, clarify yeah. that because I'm saying so, it's really mixed up. So it's quite common that after school tutoring will be a multi-day activity. So it's going to be a recurring activity. So you'd only create it once 
but then you would schedule it on the calendar for multiple dates. So you'll have a lot of activities where like it's a one-time event. You're going to do your family night on October 31st and that's done. But there are other activities like tutoring that are ongoing reoccurring. So you'd create a single activity and schedule it for multiple days. The only time that would change is if it was tutoring and if it was not specific to math. So if you have something that is, it has to have the same activity name and it has to have the same activity type in order to go in the same calendar or the same activity detail box. So keep that in mind. So this is what it would look like. This is what the screen would look like after you've added multiple days of the same activity. Um, there is a color legend at the bottom that tells you what, what these mean, why this is green, red, and yellow. The green means that, um, that the acti activity is over and that you've added your students and everything's good to go. The red means that you've just scheduled the activity and you haven't added any of the students to it, so it's waiting for you to add those students. And the yellow would mean that the students are in there, but there's no participation time, which means either the activity hasn't happened yet or the, yeah. So this means that you would have to go back in there and add the student participation uh, time. This usually is a sign that the activity hasn't happened yet, though, and you've added your students. So, um, but if you're going back and you're looking at past activities and you see a yellow box, you might want to check it out and make sure that the participation time has been added. And the red boxes are a great reminder that, okay, it's the end of the week. I need to make sure I've added students to all the red. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so this is what's going to show when you click on, so when you click on an additional date of an activity. So once you've already established the activity and you're adding the additional day of the activity, this is what's going to show up um, on that activity detail screen. So your activity is set and it's going to say, oh, here we go. We want to be on July 10th and it's going to be 2.30 to 3.30. You can actually change this. This doesn't have to stay the same. This can differ even if it's the same activity for different times. But you might have mass tutoring at different times of the day and, and you'd want to make this specific to what times that mass tutoring is. Um, so all of this can be changed. Um, as long as it belongs to this activity. Um, you can also select a date to copy. So if you have multiple days where, where the same students are showing up every day, you can actually copy that to another date. You will need to go in there though and make sure that you've added the students that have participated on that day. Otherwise, they're not automatically added. So you'll have to mark that they attended. And that's just to make sure that you don't just add students without showing their attendance. So that's a great feature to use in the example we talked about earlier where there's a financial literacy class that Europe is, is supporting every day of the quarter. So you'd create one activity called financial literacy class and then you copy that participant roster for every day that it's offered. But again, you'd need to go back and correct for attendance and remove those absent students. But that's when you'd probably use that feature most often is for a class that you're offering on a daily basis. Yep. Thank you, Marcy. <coughs> so the next screen is your activity participant screen. So this is actually where you would start adding your students. Um, down below here, you can, this is, this is going to be new to our schools from grant three. Um, this shows that uh, the staff member has been added and you can actually remove, edit, you can do the same things. You can actually also add a staff member um, at this box as well. So um, if you have more than one staff member, if it's um, Everett and they have two, Alicia, you're doing it, Wendy, you're also in there, you can add um, both people at this time. Another thing on the screen, um, just remember that all of these links, they will actually take you somewhere. So this will take you back to the activity screen. This will also take you back to the activity screen, this link right here. This will return you to the calendar, to the activity detail calendar. 
Marcy talked earlier about being able to print out sign-in sheets. You would click on the Print Me link and you'd be able to click out an, a literal sign-in sheet that would um, print out all the students' names. It would have the time and the date of the activity and the name and all the information that you'd need um, in order for students to sign in. So this is a great, great feature. I would highly recommend using this feature. To use that, you would have to preload all of the students, though. Right. You want to enter the student names first. Right. But if you just hit print me, it would print, print a blank sign. It would sheet, print a blank which sign. Which is still completely right. okay. Right. And then the Excel tab, which actually in this case means CSV, which is a, a text delimited uh, Excel file. It's a little less. You can't play with it as much. Um, as far as like adding all sorts of fancy colors and fonts to it, but it still works just fine. You can save it as an Excel file and have that opportunity to do that, but the way that it prints out at first is just um, a plain file. So if you click on the Excel file, you can download, um, once you've loaded all your students' names into this, you, can, you also have the ability to download that file as an Excel file, as a CSV file. And that goes for any of the activities. Pretty much any time you see that Excel link, that's what that means, is you can download that information. I think some schools use that as a roster to send out to teachers so they know who's going on a field trip for a day, for example. Yeah. <clears throat> so now, um, normally I demonstrate this to you, but because we're, we're showing this as screen prints, I've added some students to the screen and how it would show up if I was adding students to this particular activity. Um, we have Ritz Bits and, um, and Gummy Bear and Jolly Rancher, and then uh, Jelly Beanie is uh, our staff member here. And um, it, it, this, this box up here has not been reviewed. This is our compliance box, which we'll get into a little bit later. You can actually send me a message if you choose through here. If you click on this um, box right here, it would send a message. So if you had a message about this particular activity, you could send a message to me using that. I will send messages to you on this, regarding this particular activity, doing the same way if I have questions. Um, and then the same links are available. Um, yeah, and so this is where we were talking earlier about uh, your marking your students whether they've attended or not. If you unmark them, <laughs> if you unmark them, then it would take out their attendance. This will go blank, or you can just remove the student. Um, I wish I could demonstrate this a little better to you because this is kind of a, a good feature to demonstrate, mostly because you have to remember once the save button light, lights up, which it will after you've made any changes, you have to remember to save that. That goes for also your family participation screens. You need to make sure you're saving that information. Otherwise, you'll go back and it hasn't been saved. And so you'll get a note from me saying, did you add your participation, your family participation? You'll go, yes, I added my family participation. And I'll say, well, it's not showing. And that's usually why. is because you have not hit that save screen or that save button to make sure that happens. So single day versus multi-day activities. Many activities occur, and Marcy touched on this earlier, so I think this is just kind of reiterating that same information. Many activities occur on a single day at a specific time. However, when you have a reoccurring activity, you create a single activity, schedule it on multiple days, and times can be adjusted, which I also spoke about earlier, um, if needed. And um, and we'd like to not, I know this is hard for some people when you have a lot of people in the same school working, um, mentors and counselors, but try to avoid naming activities based on the person providing the service. Um, Marcy, can you give some examples of that? Yeah, we want the activity name to be descriptive of what's happening. And I realize there are a couple of exceptions when, when you may need to for your own clarification purposes to put the person's name or initials in it. And that's fine, but um, something like um, sessions with Marcy, 
are not very helpful to us. We don't know what happened during that time. Uh, when instead, if it said uh, mentoring sessions with Marcy, that would be better. Um, but we, the name should be descriptive and not just have a person's name. But I know, for example, uh, Vancouver, you have a lot of staff and sometimes you'll say mentoring with Marcy, mentoring with Kelly, mentoring with Nina. And, and that helps you to clarify where the entry should be made. And, and so that's still acceptable, but just thinking about naming the activities so that when Kelly's reviewing them, she's like, oh, okay, I know what they're doing during that time. And really the best thing to do is to reverse, refer back to your gear up work plan and see what you called it in the work plan. And your, your entries really should align with the work plan description. Um, and that can be really helpful. Absolutely. Um, when I'm doing compliance checks, I, I look at your work plans and that's what I'm looking for is those specific activities. And so if you are naming them something that just doesn't even closely relate, I'm going to have no idea that those two things are the same activity. So the more descriptive you can be, the more you can follow your work plan, the less time you and I will spend on the phone or in email. Also, um, sometimes, especially when you're providing individualized services, and sometimes with mentoring this is true also, you're seeing students one-on-one -on -one throughout the day and the times can really vary. And so in that case, what you want to do is create a single reoccurring event. And I think Kelly's going to talk about that now. <laughs> I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves here. So I'll turn that back to Kelly to cover. So, as Marcy was saying, um, for individualized activities, so if you have um, a mentor, like Marcy said, um, is a really good example, example that goes in throughout the day and pulls individual students out and, and does um, mentoring or tutoring, sometimes even that happens, anything, any activities like that, you can set up one activity um, for a full day, in, like I would set up a mentoring, mentoring um, Specialized services, let's say, is the activity name. You set it up on um, its own act detail, activity detail calendar, and but you make that activity for from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. When you when then that way you can go in and um, add for those students the actual specific time that they spent, meaning time section for one hour, two hours, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, um, not necessarily the time of day. But it, that's the only way that you'll be able to add individual activities um, and make them count throughout the whole day with multiple students. Does that make sense? Do you want to clarify I'm on that? I'm going to check with the group make sure yeah. that's clear. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm going to pause for a minute and take questions. I love your names. That's not really a question. Um, <laughs> we already answered that. And we already answered the other. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the support. And I can explain that more in detail. It's, it's, this is, some of this is hard for me because I'm used to being able to um, demonstrate as I go along. So the print screens um, uh, don't allow me that latitude of being able to do that. Um, at this point, I would like to say, and, and we have a few more slides before we end, but you know, any time that you would like myself, and I know this goes for Marcy too, to um, help with any more training, please let us know. That is something that I know that I'm more than happy to do, um, whether that means coming to your school, you coming here, um, whatever works best for all of those involved, uh, please do not hesitate to ask us. More than happy. I think just to add a little bit of clarification, I've seen some activities where it says it might be uh, counseling with student name A, counseling with student name B, where those are created as separate activities. And how it really should look is a single activity called individualized counseling. And then you schedule that as a multi-day event. And then you add those students for the time that you counseled them. So you should not, kind of like you shouldn't add activities named to a specific staff member, you also should not add activities named to a specific person. Another example would be job shadows. So you can create a single activity called job shadows 
and schedule it for multiple days and then each time a student goes out on a job shadow, you put them into that day. So thinking about it that way. Okay, so I'm gonna show you, we, we kind of went at, through the um, adding a student activity and next I'd kind of like to show you how to do um, a college activity and the only, or a college visit, and the only reason is because it is a little bit different in, in the fact that you're gonna add um, the actual college. So you would go in and you would set up the activity as I've shown you before, it would come up with an activity detail box. Um, when you click on the date that the activity is in, you would um, be able to add it to your calendar. So when I'm adding the activity, it's gonna be determined on whether it's gonna show the drop-down box for the college and institution of what the activity type is. Um, so once you've, you've, you've chosen the activity type, college visit and college student shadowing is when you'll be able to choose your college from the drop-down box. Respond. We're going to pause for just a okay. second. Yeah. Uh, someone lost audio, so just tell her to call back in. Sorry about that. Uh, we need to get that taken care of. Renee, I hope you can hear me now. Let me know if you can't. Please message us again if you can't hear. Um, so back to adding this. So it, you, you'd choose, you'd start typing. Okay. Thanks, Renee. I'm going to pause for just a second. Let's see if she can't get back in. If she sounds like it. Okay. Welcome back, Renee. Renee, I, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Let me get through this and then we'll definitely address that and anybody else that has that same question about um, coming to the school and, and doing some more training. Um, but let's go ahead and finish this first. So you'd add the, the school by just starting to type its name down will, will be a drop down box of uh, almost, there are so many schools in there, there's very few anymore that you can't find in there, both in-state and out-of-state. So um, you'd add that. And um, the next screen we're gonna go through really quickly is adding a family event activity. Um, you would again go, you'd add a new activity, you'd name it, a family event or the activity type would be a family event. Sorry about that. And then you would add your students and you would, in this case, you don't add the name of your adult family members, but you would add how many of them attended the family event. And you would need to make sure that you save this information to that event, otherwise, the family members will all disappear and you'll get a message from me saying you need to add your family participation. And I just point out that we only want the adult family members. So it might be that, you know, younger siblings attend and, and that's completely fine. If they are in your gear up school, you can definitely add them as participants. If they're elementary students, they're not gonna show up in the portal, so you can only add whoever shows up in the portal. But um, you know, you're not gonna add the four-year-old as a participant. So only the adult family members and the students that are in your building will be added. And you don't wanna duplicate family members. So if you have Joey and Susie, who are brother and sister, you're not gonna count their adult family members twice. So they might show up in the student roster twice because they are two individual gear up students, but you'd only enter the adult family members for one of them since they are representing those two students. I'm gonna pause for a minute. Looks like somebody else has a question. Oh. Okay, Donna, I think I'll yeah, I'll get back to you on that. I think we answered that. Um Diva. Can we pay to feed siblings? Yes, so you can um, you can pay for food for the attendees of the family night. Um, 
we don't, it's harder for us to pay for non gear up students. So if you're having a gear, say you're a cohort school serving seventh graders uh, this year and um, you know, the eighth grade brother shows up, that's okay to feed them, but you can't have a seventh and eighth grade uh, gear up night and feed everyone. You would have to distribute the funds uh, to another source. Um, what about high school siblings? Would they count as adults? Uh, not usually. Um, however, I, I can think of some cases where, you know, a high school student is the responsible adult in the family and they're there supporting that student and and getting the information on behalf of the family. So I, I can think of a few circumstances where that might be appropriate, but in general, no, you wouldn't count the high school siblings as adults. And then how about teachers that join us for family night? Yes, that's a, the new feature where you add the staff members and you would absolutely add this, all the staff members in this section. That's in the bottom part of the screen there. And then there's a button in the middle next to select grade where it says add new staff member. So we do want you to add all of the staff members that attend family nights now. Thanks for asking that. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to show you, after we've added these, I've showed you the different, we've added a family activity, we've, um, or I've shown you how to, we've, I've shown you how to add a student activity, and you've been shown how to add a college activity. Of course, these are just small samplings of, of all the stuff that you will be adding, because you guys are going to be, have a busy, busy year. And we're looking forward to it. So, um, but right now I'm going to show you what would happen if I go back and I want to click on um, this this link right here, which will take me back to my activity search screen, and um, which will take me back to a list of your activities. So when you go back to this activity search screen, you'll see all the activities that you've not only put in for the day, but that you've put in for however long. Um, the year is. So um, it's very well that you could have um, even two or three pages of activities um, here. So, and um, there's a couple ways of looking at this. It's the activity name link over on this side. If you click on that, it'll take you to the detail calendar that belongs to this activity. You have the activity type in this box right here. You can sort by these as well. It automatically defaults to alphabetical sort on this, but if you want to sort by activity type, you would click on this and it would sort these by, um, let's say you had you know, a bunch of different tutoring and math, it would sort it by that, it would sort it by all your college visits. So it's kind of handy way to look at it. Um, school, it sorts by school. So for the schools that have multi-schools, um, Spokane and um, Vancouver, uh, for somebody that had access to all three schools, this is where you use that feature. And um, then we have our dates over here. I've shown you how this expands, this little check box right here, or this plus box would expand, expand to this view to show you that you had all these dates for this that you've added of this multi-day activity. Go ahead. Um, so in that expanded view to the right um, for the after school tutoring, you can see that for 7, 6, uh, July 6, it says you had that activity for one hour and then it shows three out of three. That means three, you had three students entered for that activity as participating and three participated. So three, out, three students showed up for that day. Then on the 10th, it shows zero out of zero. That means either no students attended that day or you have not yet entered students for that day. So that's another way to just check on your own portal entry and make sure you're caught up anytime you see a zero out of zero. That might be something that you need to check. Then on the 13th, it shows zero out of three. That means you put three students in, but none of them actually participated. That might be correct or it might be an error. So another indication. 
Or it could be that the, the activity hasn't happened yet either. That could be it. Right. So, because um, they will not show up as participated until they actually participated. So, it, they will show up that way, the activities will. So, right now I'm going to show you how to edit um, an activity. So, you don't have to delete an activity every time that you, you flubbed up on, on the name or the activity type. Let's say you get a message from me and it's like, what is going on? I thought you guys went to UW Bothell. You went to the UW Seattle? That's not what I have in your, your work plan. And so, you're like, oh, well, do I have to delete the activity? And I'm like, no, you don't. We'll just edit the activity. So, if you click on the activity name, you go to the activity detail box. This will become very familiar with to you, believe me. And you want to click on the edit box right here, the edit link. That will take you to opening up your activity detail box where you can change the name. And this will open up where you'll actually be able to put your cursor in there and change it. And, and you'll actually be able to choose another school which I'll show you here. So, you will type in, oh, college visit to Bothell, and you'll find you dub Bothell from the drop-down box and change that, and then you'll save that activity. And when you come back to the activity screen, you can see that your college visit now says you dub Bothell, and the activity type is University of Washington Bothell. There may be days. So, Helene, I'm going to pause for a question. Helene has a question. If you use the wrong date, can that be corrected? So, it can, um, but you'd want to delete it off the date. So, we'll go into that. That would be more um, what I just showed you on the editing would be literally if you're just editing the name or the activity type to quote unquote edit the date, you would just delete it for the date that you put it on and re-click on the new date that it actually should be on. Um, I hope that makes sense, Helene. So in other words, um, I, I just found out that we didn't have this event actually, uh, the teacher, I'm doing the, the data entry for this particular teacher, Jelly Beanie, and um, we, she didn't have it on this date. I had missed put it on this date and it was actually on a different date. So I'm gonna need to go in there and delete this um, off the calendar. So how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna open up, it's gonna show me this box. I'm gonna click on delete, which will show up in the middle of the corner after I've clicked on this actual activity where my cursor is. This box, click on delete. It'll give me a warning message. Because I have students attached to this, it gets, the portal doesn't like that. It doesn't want you deleting students. And so it'll say, do you know that you have these students attached to this, this activity? Are you sure you want to delete it? And you'll say, yep, I'm sure. I messed that. So it'll say, okay. It'll send you um, another one and it'll say, are you sure? Are you sure you want to delete this? <laughs> really doesn't want you deleting things. Um, so you'll have to go through this a couple of times before it'll actually get to the screen that you want to see, which is the next screen where it is gone and you'll be able to delete this. So just as a side note on this though, this is an easy way to, and then Helene, what you would do is you would just put that on the date that you actually meant to have it, right? So let's say it was on the 5th, you would just re-add that same activity for the 5th. You're gonna have to re-add those students again and go through that process, but it will be off of the date, the mistaken date on the 6th. You also need to know that if you delete a date, it doesn't mean the activity has gone away. So if you have a multi-day activity that is in the calendar and you need to delete the entire activity, that means that you have to delete all the dates that the activity took place. So you literally will have to go along and delete this date, this date, this date, this date. This will finally show empty, and then you'll have a link that'll show up here, and you'll need to delete the activity at that point. So you'll, you'll see what I mean as um, we go further along in the year, and I'll be happy to do some more training on that. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about compliance, which we've um, we've touched on. 
a little bit before. Um, I'm going to go back to that screen so that I can show you. So if, if you have messages, this link will actually show up and say you have one message, you have two messages, it'll show up here in this box. This is something that's good to check every day. You'll also get a, a message in your secure message box that says um, that you have a message pending from, from the portal and that that's what these mean. This, please, this gets a little confusing because this isn't the same as the secure message box that we were talking about earlier. They're totally two separate ways of messaging you. The secure messaging that we talked about using for eligibility forms for our student information that, that you're including on student ID numbers if you need to send messaging that way, that's for that. This is for um, specific messages about the activity that you have questions about in the portal or I have questions about or Marcy has questions about for that matter. And so these messages only show up here, right, Kelly, but they'll get an email in their regular email saying you have a message. Right. So this isn't, the message won't come to your regular email, but you'll get a notice in your regular email that you need to go into the message center and check this message. Right, exactly. So um, this shows no new messages right now, but let's say that I had, um, so this actually, the messages that it, the system basically acts as a conduit between a specific activity and um, the gear up staff. So each time an activity is entered in the portal, it's reviewed, like we review everything that goes into the portal and then we mark it as compliance in review or it'll remain as not reviewed, um, which is the status right here. So if I want to review a message and I want to send you, um, or an activity and I want to send you a message about that activity, I would click on this box, which is for this activity itself, and say, hey, Jelly, I noticed that you had four hours of participation attached to this activity. Were you on campus that long, or did this include travel time? If it does include the travel time, it shouldn't. Can you please correct this activity if necessary? And then you would be able to respond to me by saying, well, Kelly, this is Jelly, and um, it was, actually. We did spend that entire four hours, and, and I, can, I can show you on an agenda for that, and then we should be set. And I would say, great, and I would mark that activity compliant. So that just is a quick view. Again, I am so sorry. I am, I'm, I have a hard time with screenshots. I would much prefer to be doing a live demo. Um, so I'm sorry if this may be a little bit more confusing than it needs to be at this point. So now we have an activity report screen. This is another screen that's found from your drop down box. And I'm going to pause for a minute and see if I can't ask. Uh, answer this question that's going on here. Oh, okay. Okay, Nicole, thank you. Yeah, and we are almost done. Yes, we are. And I'll, I'll try to go a little bit faster through this. Um, everything else we can do either on site or over the phone. So activity report screen, it's another one of the choices that you have from your drop down. This just is going to give you a list of four different activities that you're able to get to. An activity summary by school, which shows up something like this. You have an activity list by school, student detail by school, and students with completed college apps. This is a quick shot at your master calendar screen, which shows all of the activities that you have scheduled for the days that they're scheduled. Um, in, so in June, this particular school had uh, a mentoring activity up in June 1st, et cetera, et cetera. If any of these activities didn't have students in them or were waiting on student activity participation time, these would show up yellow and green. So it's another way to get a good view of all of your activities um, and what your student status participation time is on it. Professional development screen is here. Um, you add a professional development screen, add new session, um, like you're going to be adding your webinar later. Um, you add it, you add the session type, you click on the activity just like you would a student activity. You 
you would add, in this case, you would add the webinar because this is a webinar. You would save and go to participation. And you would start adding your staff members. For a while, um, you'll need to add all your new staff members because none will be in here. As time goes along, you'll be able to just start typing the staff member's name and they'll show up um, in a drop down box. So you'll only need to add them once to uh, the, the staff list. You'll need to choose a staff role for them. Um, chocolate chip or chip chocolate, it um, has a choice of being a teacher, administrator, counselor, certificated staff, gear up staff, and um, the remaining. This is your advisory committee members, which we showed you earlier for your advisory committee. You can update and delete staff members. So if you have somebody leave, you can click on this box and you can actually take them off the list so that they don't give you a cluttered list. Um, always a good thing to do. This is a quick shot of that. So if I want to delete myself off that list or this person, Jelly, off the list, then I would just delete. And they would no longer show up as um, a person to add to that activity. And your student search screens. Um, this is on your student tab from your activity pages. Uh, you would be able to look for your students by either putting in a social security, or, I'm sorry, a student ID number, um, their first name, last name, and then you would click on search. You can search by grade as well. This expands a little bit more of the activity. You would search or, or their participation. You would click on their student ID number, and this would um, expand to show the different activities that they had participated in during the years that they're involved in Gear Up. I'm going to pause for a second. Rachel, I think, had a question. All right, wait for the end. I'm sorry, Deborah. And then, Rachel, I can't add the activities portal now. Yes, Rachel, you can go ahead and start adding your activities and just make sure this is for everybody. You can add all the activities you want to, you just won't be able to add the activities. The, the students to those activities yet, and um, hopefully soon that will, will happen. But by all means, practice and um, start adding and getting those activities in the portal. Thanks, Rachel. This is a quick screen on adding college applications. This is also explained pretty clearly in your, um, your, your student definition um, manual and you can find that in the coordinator manual. So you would add, you would go to the student tab, find the student that you want to add, and this is only um, goes for the priority schools right now who have seniors. Cohort schools aren't doing that until you have seniors. You add the ab application, you add the school and the date that they submitted to that school, and then at some point you would want to go back and tell us who those students were and what school they were accepted to. Do you want to add anything to that, Marcy? No. If you were to run a college, remember on those activity reports we had earlier, this is your, your um, activity report for college applications. You would be able to run a report at any time and see what students had been added to that list. It would tell you here who's been accepted, the submission date, et cetera, and all the other information that you'd need. Um, for that. You can also uh, CSV that Excel, download that into a, a, a Excel folder. You can add notes to the student tabs. I will show you more on this um, at individual training if you'd like. It's not something that is used all that much. It's really to the individual user whether or not um, you want to use that. Okay, so this is where you would want to um, securely message us. And when we were back at the prior screen, at the home screen, and I gave you those choices that say change your password and messages and files, this is where you would um, send a secure message from. There's also very clear instructions on how to do this. On online. 
So I'm just going to go ahead and um, skip through this because it looks like we're pretty much running out of time at this point. Marcy, do you want to say yeah, anything I, more I about this? I think just refer to the directions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So just as some final reminders, uh, we, again, really want to honor confidentiality. So please, in regular email, do not send us any identifiable student information. That means SSID numbers, um, any information about students. We don't want to have that in regular email because we can't protect or guarantee the confidentiality of that. So that should come through the secure messaging system. Also, um, we ask that you not share personal situations with us about students. Again, we consider that confidential. Um, and, and so don't, don't call and talk to us about, for example, uh, Susie's documentation status. Um, that should be protected information. But we do want to hear good stories. So when good things happen, you don't necessarily have to tell us the student name or anything, but you can share those good stories with us, and we like to have that to be able to pass that on and report on that. So if you have copies of newspaper articles or newsletter features, pictures, um, make sure you have a release for that student that's in the manual also, um, but send that along. And then our even better if for that is if you post it to our social media channels. So uh, we gave all that at our November workshop so you have that information. And again, there is a media release form in the coordinator manual. You should just have those signed by all students so you know you can share that. Some school districts have students sign that anyway, separate from Gear Up, and that also uh, makes it okay to share with us. So I think that we've answered most of the questions. I have one question, Kelly, for you. Are you going to pre-enter the Gear Up Pro Dev as you have in the past, or should we enter them on our own? So you preloaded those. Before. Yeah, let's go ahead and start out by, by entering them on your own, and if I get caught up enough, then I will make sure that I get the rest out there and send out notification that they're already in okay. the portal. So for Gear Up West in our November workshop, please go ahead and enter those on your own. We'll try to get the March and April uh, set up for yeah. you. All right, and so finally, um, if you have questions or would like to schedule an in-person training, please contact Kelly. She's happy to come out and work with you individually or on the phone even. Um, but we're happy to come out and just uh, do site visits with you to work on portal entry, uh, especially if you're new. That might be really helpful. Uh, for now, what you need to know is uh, document, document, document everything. Make sure you're doing those sign-in sheets for all activities and uh, then start getting caught up as soon as we get students. And I've been trying all morning to find out when we're going to have students in the system and unfortunately don't have an answer yet, uh, but we hope that it will be sometime this week. So that is the end of the show for the day. Um, Thank you so much for participating. I'm sorry we went so far over, uh, but this will be recorded and we'll send out that link as well as the PowerPoint. So thank you and let us know uh, how we can help. Cool.